All right, everyone, uh, let's get started. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Roland Vogel. I'm executive director of CODEX, uh, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics. Uh, CODEX is a joint center between the law school and the computer science department. Uh, our mission is uh, to use uh, information technology uh, uh, to make the legal system more um, efficient. We uh, research and develop technologies <clears throat> that make the legal system more efficient for all stakeholders in the legal system. Um, and uh, yeah, so no, uh, nobody uh, kind of represents that spirit of making the legal system uh, more efficient than uh, Professor Carver. Uh, Professor Carver is a faculty member at uh, Berkeley's Information School. Uh, he uh, focuses on uh, cyber law, uh, but also on legal technology and making the legal system and uh, legal source materials uh, more accessible. Uh, and so today he will be talking about his flagship program uh, in, this, uh, in this context, and that's the Free Law Project. Um, and so, uh, so without further ado, I'll just turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, so thanks very much for coming out. Uh, I am Brian Carver, and uh, tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I, uh, I actually don't have a technology background that comes with a official piece of paper. Uh, I instead uh, got an Atari 2600 when I was a kid and <laughs> was a geek uh, from that point on. Um, and playing Pac-Man was so compelling right, that I uh, fell in love and uh, actually studied philosophy and some other things. Um, but when I saw in the late 90s and early 2000s that uh, technology was advancing much more quickly than the law was keeping up. Uh, it got very interesting to me, and so I uh, decided to go to law school. Went to one of those other law schools here in the Bay Area. Uh, rhymes with Holt Ball. I anyway, you um, may not have heard of it. Um, <laughs> and um, had a great time uh, there. Uh, did a little practice uh, at a Silicon Valley-based law firm uh, doing IP litigation and uh, general commercial litigation. I actually really enjoyed uh, litigation as well. I my wife did not enjoy the amount of time I spent there. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> um, then the opportunity came to, to go to the iSchool, and it was, uh, it was a, a great idea for me. They, they let me teach exactly what I want. I do the cyber law course every spring that's cross-listed with the law school, um, and then an IP survey course every fall. Um, and uh, also get to advise students in our master's program on their final projects. And that's uh, really the genesis of uh, most of what I'm going to talk about here today is, is one of those projects um, and how it just won't go away. <laughs> um, so let's, let's get into this topic, though, <clears throat> by taking you back to uh, the preface to the very first Federal Reporter um, published by West uh, in 1880. There were, of course, other case reports prior to this, but this was the, the reporter series to cover uh, all of the federal circuit courts and, and some of uh, the district courts. And Peyton Boyle, the editor, says, the federal reporter is devoted exclusively to the prompt and complete publication of the judicial opinions delivered in each of the United States circuit and district courts. By this means, Many able and learned opinions will be rescued from a most undeserved oblivion, while greater uniformity in the interpretation of the federal statutes and the practice of the various federal courts will at the same time be secured. It would seem, therefore, that such an undertaking is not only possessed of great intrinsic merit, but now that it has been fairly inaugurated, it actually appears to present itself in the light of a public necessity. So. <clears throat> This actually did cause you know, something of a sensation, so much as you can have a sensation in the legal publishing community of 1880. Um, the uh, various uh, law reviews and journals uh, of the day and uh, state bar associations and whatnot um, you know, did their review of books and mentioned, hey, there's this thing now. Every library should get one. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, it was a big deal. It, it made the New York Times. Uh, in commenting on the Federal Reporter, they wrote, a publication that will do this will be a public boon. 
They said, if it's of prime importance to secure the prompt and accurate publication of statutes in order that the legal profession and the people may know the laws, it would seem to be hardly less important to apply the same rule to judicial decisions. For these, as well as the statutes, go to make up the law. And neither clients nor their lawyers can always find out what the law is unless the judicial interpretations of the law are made accessible in public print. So um, that's quite a, a kind review. Uh, it, it's a public boon. And you could subscribe to their weekly uh, editions uh, and then get the bound volume uh, and pay for that on an annual basis. Uh, and they assured you that the bound volumes would not exceed about 1,000 pages. And, and so we were off and, and running with this collection uh, and publication of the federal uh, circuit court and district court opinion. Now, <clears throat> I, I probably should have started by asking uh, who in this group uh, is already of the view right, that, uh, that my topic speaks of, that it is long past time for uh, the entirety of US case law to be available for free online. Let's see who's. Uh, OK, there's still a few I can convert. Good. Um, but I, I am mostly preaching to the choir. I'm aware of that. And so I, I, I give you these first two examples um, uh, to try and start to tease out what are the reasons, good reasons, if any, right, for, for making uh, judicial opinions available and for making the law something that the public can read. Um, so here's some evidence from the 1880s, but it goes back much further than that. I want to also share with you a little excerpt from Edmund Burke in 1775, who said, permit me, sir, to add another circumstance in our colonies, which contributes no mean part towards the growth and effect of this untractable spirit. Us Americans, you know, we have an untractable spirit. <clears throat> I mean their education. In no country, perhaps in the world, is the law so general a study. But all who read, and most do read, endeavor to obtain some smattering in that science, that is the law. This study, the study of the law, renders men acute, inquisitive, dexterous, prompt in attack, ready in defense, full of resources. In other countries, the people, more simple and of a less mercurial cast, judge of an ill principle in government only by an actual grievance. Here, they anticipate the evil and judge of the pressure of the grievance by the badness of the principle. They augur misgovernment at a distance and snuff the approach of tyranny in every tainted breeze. This is just fabulous stuff, right? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> what, what are all of these uh, folks saying about the reading of the law and the publication of the law and its accessibility to the public? Well. Here's my list so far of pre-1880 right, reasons to collect and publish court opinions. We're going to rescue able and learned opinions from a most undeserved oblivion. right? Um, and that was uh, quite literally uh, likely. right? Uh, judges would maybe sometimes only speak aloud their opinion. In the, in, uh, or if they wrote it down, it resides in some courthouse scattered across the country. And until somebody decides to collect these together and put them in print, um, they can waste away. And you may have recently seen uh, some historical records being burned in, in North Carolina, right? When you leave things in courthouses untended to, you never know, right, what may happen to them. Um, well, <clears throat> we're also going to secure this greater uniformity in the interpretation of the federal statutes and the practice of the various federal courts. That's long been a, a reason cited for the publication of court opinions, that other judges need to know what the law is and what other judges are doing so that they themselves can do the same thing when presented with similar circumstances. Um, and if these opinions are published and widespread, it enables that sort of uh, uh, common law system that we have. Uh, they think there's some great intrinsic merit to the undertaking. We, we, we may get to say more about that later. You say it's a public necessity and a public boon, all these sort of general things. We'll try and think about why that might be later. But we're also given us this analogy with statutes, right? That it was maybe already accepted that you had to publish the law itself, right? The statutes, that not doing that <clears throat> takes us out of societies ruled by law and into tyranny, right? Um, but 
they say, look, if the public doesn't really know the law if they've just got the statutes. If the courts are going to interpret these statutes and what really matters is the court's interpretation of those statutes, then I've got to have access to those court interpretations as well if I'm really to know the law. Um, and, and, and Burke's reason, right, this is a, it's a necessity for our democracy, it seems, right, that what reading the law enables in a public is this ability to anticipate evils in government. You can see it coming at a distance. <laughs> uh, you snuff out tyranny through these means, right? Grand claims. Um, and I, I could have gone and found some other 19th century figures for a couple other reasons that I'm going to give you, but I didn't think we wanted to dwell on this too long, and so I'm just going to throw a couple more reasons at you. Um, if we do have this common law system built on precedent, then that's going to of necessity require publication of court opinions. And this is a claim I actually found in a publication of our current administrative office of the courts in a document that they give to foreign judges. Um, uh, and, uh, so, so, and this was just recently published, like 2010. So this is, I think, the current view of the administrative office of the courts is that we have to uh, publish court opinions in order to uh, enable the operation of a system of precedent. Uh, if we think of ourselves as a country that operates under the rule of law, then part of what that has to mean is that the rule of law is based on reasoned rules. Right? And if there are reasons, right, then the judges need to give those reasons for their decisions, and those reasons have to be open to public scrutiny. One of the things that does is encourage judicial integrity. If a judge has to give reasons for a decision and has to make those reasons open to wide public scrutiny, they're harder to influence or bribe. I can't say, hey, here's $20,000. Just make sure this case comes out the right way. And they're not required to you know, provide any reason or rationale for their decision. This sort of corruption becomes possible. right? Um, and again, a study of those who are trying to uh, aid in the establishment of the rule of law in other countries um, you'll find a lot of rich material like this, right, um, uh, where they single out, hey, we need to start having the judges give reasons for their decisions, and we need them to publish them um, if we're going to get a handle on this corruption problem. And actually, I could go on. There's due process arguments, equal protection arguments, free speech arguments. At some point, I should proceed, though. So in 2014, what are our reasons to collect and publish court opinions? I think they're the same in many ways. Um, that first bullet point has maybe a new flair to it. Uh, these able and learned opinions and, and other legal materials um, are quite literally sometimes being rescued from a undeserved oblivion. Some examples. Um, now maybe uh, the opinions themselves rarely suffer this fate today. But most court websites do only post the opinions for a period of time. The uh, California courts will put the opinions on their pages for about 90 days, and then they just go away. Right? Um, there's another place on, on their website where you can access older stuff, um, but you know, it's as if they haven't heard that hard drive space is cheap or something. I don't know. So they're rotating the opinions off right? <laughs> after a period of time. Um, but you know, people are collecting these opinions. There's no real danger that that's the only copy. Um, quite another situation exists, though, with respect to oral argument audio. Um, at the circuit court level, many, uh, at federal circuit court uh, level, many of the courts have been making oral argument audio available on their websites for years. But those files are quite large, the audio files. And so maybe they had some actual reason for wanting to rotate those off. Um, and it's less clear that anybody is collecting those and preserving them for future research purposes. Um, as I, I love going to oral argument and watch. I've seen some of the most fascinating things I've ever seen in the law occur at oral argument, right? And so uh, that this record uh, of that is potentially just being deleted to make room for the next round um, horrifies archivists like myself, right? Um, and so <clears throat> uh, that's one of the things, actually, that uh, the Free Law Project intends to turn its attention to probably this year, is, is making sure that we're gathering all that audio. I, I sent a, uh, a desperate email 
about 14 years ago to the Internet Archive and said, do you guys know they delete this stuff? <laughs> you know, you've got to start <laughs> archiving this. You know? And uh, I think they have actually um, done some of that. But uh, the, the circuit courts are not even always consistent with their policies on this. Uh, for the longest time, the DC circuit uh, had the worst policy imaginable about the oral argument audio. They, not only would they not post it on their website, they wouldn't provide it to you at all, even if you were willing to pay a fee. Um, as a general member of the public, you, you could not request the audio of oral argument. If you were a litigant in the case, then you could pay $25 and get a CD sent to you. But then I think you also had to agree that you're not going to distribute it beyond, you know. And, and so it, it was madness. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, they've recently cha changed that uh, 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 policy. But um, <clears throat> on the greater uniformity in the interpretation of the law, I think this problem actually does persist today um, because judges, especially at the federal district court level, make so many decisions that are actually never published, uh, even as unpublished decisions. I mean, Lexis and Westlaw still do exercise some discretion in which opinions they choose to collect. And it's expensive and not easy to dig around in the PACER system yourself. And so, quite literally, uh, federal district court judges are deciding cases and even providing reasons, and nobody knows about it except them and the, the litigants in that case. Other federal district court judges who might confront the very same matter don't get the benefit of that prior opinion. And so if I could get the PACER system freed up um, and we could get all of that material out of there, we, we could do something to uh, to, to prevent at least that problem. Um, there, there's a concomitant problem that, that goes with this of uh, too many opinions, right? Um, it, it's for some time been a, a great worry that uh, with the increased workload of the courts, they may issue too many opinions and the, then the research task for lawyers becomes more difficult and time consuming. And so that this can also be, be a problem. I, I think um, technology is, is helping us with this problem, right? That, that we are catching up to that problem uh, in a way that um, your search uh, functionality in any legal database that you might use with the filters that you can apply to it could very quickly drop to the bottom uh, these extraneous cases that people were worried were going to bog us down. Right? They might still bog down the judges uh, and take up their time in, in writing them up, but in large part what I'm talking about are the ones that they're already writing up. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, that we should let that problem dissuade us. Maybe we should hire more Article III judges, right? Um, so <clears throat> if the caseloads really warrant it. So um, I could go through each, I guess, but uh, I think all these reasons have a counterpart today. But I've been talking about just the publication of court opinions, right? I've said nothing about my actual claim in the title of this talk, that they should be online, that it should be free. So don't be persuaded yet. Right? Let's talk about why should it be online, right? Haven't you heard of the county law library, Brian? You know, what are you so worked up about, right? The public has access to this material. Well, I don't think anybody actually is going to press that case uh, too hard, right? Um, the, the convenience of online, its greater reach, its efficiency, it's actually, it's actually cost less um, for both the providers and the users of these materials if I don't have to catch the bus to go to the county law library when they're open, <laughs> when they're open and use a bound volume that somebody paid for and so on. Um, and, and I actually would compare it um, with the, the Google Books project that's, that's been in the news recently for a favorable court decision they got on their fair use argument. Um, when that was still called Google Print back in 2005, their CEO, Eric Schmidt, um, wrote in the Wall Street Journal an argument for the Google Print project, and it was now the Google Book Search uh, project. Um, and what he said, uh, it's, it's quite rousing. Yeah, I, I like to imagine it as this grand speech, but he says, imagine sitting at your computer and in less than a second, searching the full text of every book ever written. Imagine a historian being able to instantly find every book that mentions the Battle of Algiers. Imagine a high school student in Bangladesh discovering an out-of-print author held only in a library in Ann Arbor. 
Imagine one giant electronic card catalog that makes all the world's books discoverable with just a few keystrokes by anyone, anywhere, anytime. He, he said this. I'm not making this up. I may be adding tone, but, right? but it really is this grand. right? Imagine the cultural impact of putting tens of millions of previously inaccessible volumes into one vast index, every word of which is searchable by anyone, rich and poor, urban and rural, first world and third, and all, of course, entirely for free. This egalitarianism of information dispersal is precisely what the web is best at, precisely what leads to powerful new business models for the creative community. So I can sort of poke fun at the tone of this, but there's something to this argument, right? That he asks you to imagine what is now technically not just feasible, but easy to do, right? We have the ability to scan it all, right? We have the processing power to index it all. We've got the computers that could, with just a few keystrokes, execute that search on that giant database and give you back these results. And the form of the argument is sort of, this is such an amazing feat, right, that as soon as it becomes possible for us to do something like this, then, then we should do something like this, right? Um, and, and that's not always a good moral argument, right? Um, but here it, it might be, right? And uh, if it's good for uh, all the world's books, uh, I think how much more so uh, for all the world's uh, judicial opinions, right? Um, because it's going to have some of those same benefits uh, described earlier. <clears throat> but that's just taking advantage of the power of the internet, of technology. I've said something further. I've said it should be free, something that Eric Schmidt agrees with me on, at least with respect to books. <clears throat> but why free? Right? Why should the entirety of US case law be available online for free? What's wrong with third party providers that charge subscription fees? Well, nothing. There's nothing wrong with fee-based services. They provide, oftentimes, additional valuable services beyond mere access to the documents. So good. Let's have a bunch of those, actually, is what my position would be. But a free service is going to reach many more people. Think of Eric's uh, uh, third world examples, right? Rich and poor alike, this egalitarianism. And actually, it's going to enable more of those third party innovators, I think. Um, the uh, availability of this raw material, I think, will act as uh, an engine of innovation in the legal technology space. There are lots of uh, smart folks who think they can build a better mousetrap, right? They uh, look at what the uh, existing vendors have done for, you know, with really total control of the market for the last several decades. And they've done some really impressive stuff, but some of these folks are really smart and think they can do better, right? Or they've got a different idea, or hey, I want to try this, right? Um, maybe that would make this research task a little bit easier. Um, and uh, one of the impediments they have to testing that out is that they need these raw materials, right? If, if we give them uh, all of these documents as a starting point, then they can go to you know, the folks on Sand Hill Road and say, look, here's my prototype. I, I used these documents from Court Listener, <laughs> right, to show you how it would work, right, you know. Um, but what I'm really doing, what's really cool about my new thing is the search interface or the way we visualize this and that or the, the connections that we make between the cases or whatever their innovation may be. <clears throat> um, and you could charge a toll, right, uh, on those innovators uh, and it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a unbearable drag uh, on that innovation. But I, I think it's an easy argument to make that we could get even more of that. Uh, and, and we don't need any drag on that sort of innovation. I'd like to see a lot more of it. So uh, I'm actually going to, in a very pedantic way, spell out the argument then. <laughs> right? um, I think there's compelling reasons, some of which I've discussed, to collect and publish court opinions online for free. I think the resources necessary to accomplish this task are readily available. This is not technologically difficult anymore. Uh, there aren't any sort of countervailing reasons, no, no compelling reasons, or at least not more compelling reasons not to do this. I want to actually address that a little bit in what comes next, because one might be 
uh, if somebody's already doing this, then I shouldn't do it, right? For instance, we shouldn't you know, waste resources on multiple people uh, uh, doing the same thing, maybe, right? Uh, but <clears throat> I think we can even say that the, the con side is, is relatively low here. And now this assumption might need some tinkering, uh, but in general, when there's more compelling reasons to do a task than not, and the resources necessary to accomplish it are readily available, then do that task. Right? This is a good general principle, I think. A little utilitarian, um, but that shouldn't bother us too much. And, and so therefore, the task should be done. Here's the problem, though. All of these premises have been true for many years. It's not as if this happened you know, over your Christmas break. Right? In the December of 2013, suddenly everything co coalesced so that this became possible. I would say, you know, easily, 10 years ago, 2003, this was possible. If we wanted maybe just say a, a, a Gutenberg library uh, type uh, plain text dump of the entirety of US case law, we could have got that in 1998 or so. You know, I mean, 15, 10 years, um, this has been completely feasible and the reasons haven't changed, right, since 1775, right, for why we would want to do this. Um, so. That's what makes me say I think it's long past time for this. Well, how about that problem of, hey, is there somebody better suited to the task, right? Maybe I should step out of the way. Why not just use Google, right? Isn't Google Scholar free? They provide access to court opinions. Or there's others, Fine Law, Justia, Cornell's Legal Information Institute. There's a lot of people in the free law game. <clears throat> um, well, no. None of these free services provide the entirety of U.S. case law. Um, and it's actually not just that nobody has, has it all out there yet. It's, it's that you can't even figure out what the state of the situation is right, at, at most of these sites. Um, now, on our site, we have coverage graphs for every single jurisdiction we cover. And I don't know how well you can see this. I chose the Louisiana Court of Appeal. And um, this is the year's. So we've got cases going back to 1950. If you hover over these little dots, they'll, they'll show you exactly how many cases we have for each year. And you could look at this and go, there's something up with court listeners' coverage of the Louisiana Courts of Appeal. In 2012, they just drop off a cliff. And, and where's 2013, right? We don't have it at all, right? So our, our coverage is incomplete. Um, we, we've uh, been get, donated a collection that only went so far and then stopped. And, and we currently have not started the daily t uh, intake of those opinions. But at least we're transparent about it, right? We show you, here's what we got, right? And if you have an issue where you're doing research on Louisiana law, you're gonna be in the Court of Appeal, you need to know, right, what's going on in that jurisdiction, don't use our site. Right? We don't, we're not gonna be able to tell you about last year's developments in your area of concern. Now, if you try this same sort of exercise on Google Scholar, you will be thwarted. Right? There is no coverage page that shows you what have we got uh, for each jurisdiction. But you can sort of get a proxy for it by doing a search for the word court. Because there's not many court opinions <laughs> that don't contain the word court somewhere in them. So I did that. And I chose uh, a filter of the Louisiana Court of Appeals. and I sorted them by date so that we could see the most recent ones first. And I did this yesterday to make this screenshot. And we've got a couple opinions. Let's take uh, the Fourth Circuit Louisiana Court of Appeals. The most recent opinion they had yesterday when I did this um, was this State v. Vessel case. Okay? And at the top, you also get this sort of weird estimate. There's about 110,000 results. What are we to make of that? Well. <clears throat> That's actually about what I would expect of the entirety of the Louisiana Court of Appeals uh, corpus. Uh, but I only know that because I know what court listener has and, what we do, and a, a general idea of what we don't have. I mean, I don't think the average person goes, oh, yes, there should be about 110,000 Louisiana Court of Appeals opinions. They must have it all. Right? But I, I would bet that they have it all uh, based on that number, if it's accurate. Right? Um, and the most recent one from the Fourth Circuit yesterday was State v. Vessel. Well, let's go to the Louisiana Court of Appeal Fourth Circuit website yesterday. I took a screenshot. And you know this was late in the afternoon. <laughs> State v. Vessel, 
Where is it? Uh, whoa, way down here, right? There were one, two, three, four, five, six more recent opinions um, on their website than in, there were in Google's index. And um, that State v. Vessel case is actually from about five days ago. Um, and there is that kind of lag to get into Google Scholar. They are collecting the daily material, but it's not same day, right? There's a, there's a couple day lag. On Court Listener, if we're collecting on a site, you usually are going to have it within like 30 minutes of it going on their site, uh, but it could be a little bit, it's going to be same day for sure, right? And so to me, um, especially, uh, I'll talk about this more later, with the daily awareness service that was the motivation for Court Listener, um, that's utterly unacceptable, right? Uh, I like to know about developments in the law the same day. I, I got a, uh, an email, I guess it was Wednesday, maybe Tuesday, when did this opinion come out? Um, yeah, Tuesday morning, saying somebody on Marketplace wants to talk about the net neutrality ruling that just came out, are you available in 20 minutes? And I'm like, that opinion is 60 pages long and there's a 12 page dissent, right? You know, or concurrence and partial dissent. Um, no, I haven't read that yet and I'm not going to Marketplace to talk about it. Um, but this is the sort of timeliness that I need, right? You know, um, I, and that some journalists need, right? When an opinion comes out, I need it immediately, start digesting it. Um, and, and I'm not gonna get that with Google Scholar. Okay. How about Justia? Um, you can browse their coverage, um, but when you get to their coverage of Louisiana case law, it goes Supreme Court, First Circuit, Second Circuit, and then it just, <laughs> there's this blank spot. And if you're not familiar with the circuit court system in Louisiana, there's a third, and there's a fourth that covers New Orleans, and a fifth, <laughs> right? And so there's a gap there in Justia's coverage that is, I guess, maybe obvious to practitioners in Louisiana, but maybe not the general public. Um, if you care about the law in New Orleans, um, you need a different website, right? I love the guys at Justia. They're some of my favorite people in the world. But the point is, I, I want to, and, and I'm not trying to put down either Google Scholar or Justia or Fine Law, any of these sites, they're great. Uh, you should use them. <laughs> um, but I, I want to make the point that this is not a solved problem, right? That's what I'm up against a lot of the time is people like, oh, we, we have all this stuff, don't we? Or Google Scholar is good enough, right? Um, in many cases, no, right? It's actually not a solved problem. Um, another thing uh, that distinguishes what I'm trying to do is bulk downloads. There, there's no other free service that provides bulk downloads. I can't go to Google Scholar and just say, hey, I'd like those 110,000 decisions. Could I click a button and get those now, <laughs> right? Um, no, uh, but on Court Listener, you could. Uh, we're glad to give you actually our entire corpus. Um, don't everybody go do that at once. It's, it's many, many gigabytes, right? But, <laughs> but you might bring down the site while I'm talking. But um, it's there for you. And one of the things this does is enable academic research. Uh, if I have a question about the law uh, generally, uh, I'm doing some empirical study, uh, the, the bigger the data set I'm working from, the more generality my result will have. So I really need everything. Um, and I mentioned earlier, right, if you've got these bulk downloads, then startups can take them and go running and do what they think is cool. No other free service is built entirely on open source software, but my effort is. <clears throat> Why does that matter? I call this the what if Brian and Michael get hit by a bus problem, right? Um, <laughs> uh, there have been many people who have tried to solve this problem before. There was alt law. Um, some of the people who we've gotten documents from sort of piddled about with this for a while and then stopped, right? And, and so um, what tends to happen, though, is when those folks run out of money or interest or whatever it is, their site just disappears. All their effort, whatever they put into it, is, is gone as well. And the next person who comes along right, has to start over from scratch. This is a terrible way to, <laughs> to, to do a, a long-term task like, like we face. Um, and so... I don't want to use any proprietary software. I don't want to pay anybody a license fee for anything I'm doing um, that might restrict somebody else from being able to pick up where I left off. If, if I do have this bad car accident on the way home today, and if my colleague Mike, uh, who's the, the chief developer, uh, you know, falls off of a waterfall in, in gorgeous New Zealand where he is now, <laughs> um, 
and, and we stop working on this entirely, well, for one thing, the site is relatively bug free. It'll just keep running for a, a while, right? You know, <clears throat> um, so that's good. But then also, you can go to bitbucket.org and download all the source to put Court Listener on your own server. It's going to be a basic Linux server that anybody can install in minutes, right? You know, well, maybe not anybody, but you know, call your hosting provider. They will set you up in minutes with a server that could run this uh, software. And we provide bulk downloads of all the documents, so you can get the software, you can get the documents, you can mash them together, and the next day, somebody else picks up where we left off, right? No one has to do this work again, right? We're gonna do this once and then stop it, right? You know, um, that's a great advance over uh, the efforts that have come before. Um, something we announced just last fall that I think also is a distinguishing feature of our effort is the, the REST API. Um, if you're not familiar with APIs, it's just a way for computers to talk to computers. And, and, and Google has a lot of APIs. That's why people can make cool mashups with Google Maps and other things like this. But they won't provide an API for the law, and nobody else has ever done this, um, even for a fee, right, uh, until we did. And that enables cool things. Like the folks at uh, the Sunlight Foundation had this product, Scout, that would enable you to keep track of changes to uh, regulations, uh, to uh, things that happen on the, um, uh, things that happen in government. It covers three or four different categories, I forget. Um, but as soon as we released the API, they said, oh cool, now we can uh, just add on court opinions as another thing that we could allow our users to track. And they started in ingesting uh, our court opinions and uh, Scout users can now get daily alerts on, on uh, whatever they're interested in uh, that happens in the courts as well. Also, the good folks at State Decoded um, are in the process of uh, integrating the API. So, that, you know, and if you're not familiar, the State Decoded folks make readable versions of the statutes that are really nicely formatted, put them online. Um, and it's good to have the statute, but now with the API, they can um, put in the margin court opinions interpreting that statute pulled from court listener, right? And so it makes their, what they were already doing enormously more useful to their end users. <clears throat> so I, I think the API, it's a little geeky and some people's eyes glaze over when you start talking about it, but it's gonna end up being enormously important. Um, I actually can't believe that the powers that be have allowed us to be first <laughs> um, in this. It's, they will look back and think it was a very foolish thing to let me become the infrastructure of the legal technology in internet, right? Um, but, okay. <clears throat> so, I've mentioned Court Listener a couple times. That's the web platform <clears throat> that uh, started all of this. And um, what happened was, uh, as I've sort of mentioned already, I have this interest in staying on top of the areas of law that, that I focus on. So if a new copyright opinion comes out of the Seventh Circuit, I want to know about it today, right? You know, same day. I want to write a blog post about it. I don't want to find out about it a week later from some other blo law blogger who's writing about it. And I'm like, well, why didn't I know about that, right? And when, when I was at um, a, one of these big law firms in the area, I used many of these paid services, um, but was uniformly dissatisfied with them. They were usually over-inclusive, and so they would send me all Ninth Circuit opinions that came out today, and I get all these insurance cases and habeas cases, and I'm like, no, I'm not, <laughs> not my field. Um, or they'd be under-inclusive, right? Uh, they would only send you what they thought were the important opinions, and I'm like, well, what you think is important is not actually what I think is important, right? You know, that weird uh, case about comic books was actually really interesting to me, you know, or whatever. Um, and uh, oftentimes they were not very timely, right? Uh, I want to know about it the same day. Oftentimes you get it uh, the same week or you know within a couple days. Um, and many of them were very expensive. So I explained this situation to Michael Listener, a student um, at the time, uh, uh, fall of 2009, and said, "Why don't you fix this for me?" Right? Uh, all of the federal circuit courts and the Supreme Court of the United States post the opinions to their website each day. You would just build a web crawler that would go to all these pages, gather up the opinions, put them in a database for us, make it searchable, uh, set it up so that I can create sort of like Google Alerts for the court, right? Um, that was a product that was already out there I was using, was familiar with. Um, and 
you know, send me an email every day at 5.30, right, to let me know what queries of mine had a new uh, opinion come out. And <clears throat> I, I told some folks at lunch, uh, Michael came to our program as an English major, and I was really proud that he did this entirely by himself in a couple months, right? He built the court listener platform, uh, and in May of 2010, it was pretty much as good as it is now at the daily alert problem, right? Um, but, uh, and on those qualities, it was completely customizable down to, you know, my Boolean search query, exactly what I wanted, right? Which made it super customizable so that it would include exactly those hits that I wanted and not the extraneous stuff. Um, it was coming to my mailbox every day, and it was free, right? Um, so he, I think, right, completely obliterated the space and, and uh, made all of the paid services look bad, right, in a couple of months. But the problem with the site was we just turned on those web crawlers in March of 2010, and all that we had were the opinions from that date forward. So as a general purpose research you know, tool, it was useless, right? Unless you only cared about things that had happened from 2010 to the present. Um, and so it was very narrowly focused on this daily awareness problem, and it was a great solution for that. But he and I both knew, you know, people are gonna try and use this to just do research generally, and it's bad at that. <laughs> we need the, the back corpus. We need the historical documents for it to be useful for that purpose. And he went and got a, he graduated, got a real job in San Francisco working for a, a, a legal search uh, company. And uh, they were kind enough to give him a flexible schedule where he had Fridays off. And so he just kept working on Court Listener on the side. And he, he's the alumnus of the school that I email with more frequently than any other. We, we've talked almost every day, probably, uh, since he graduated in 2010, and have just tried to uh, improve the coverage of the site, improve the features, and, and, and so on in, in, in a lot of different ways, more than I could cover. Um, let me tell you some of those features quickly, though. Um, we're now up to nearly two and a half million documents, including the entire Supreme Court corpus from one US one on. That's about 64,000 documents. We've got a mostly complete circuit court at the federal level corpus uh, from about the late 40s to present. Um, the federal district courts in the states is mixed, right? It is a partial coverage. We're gonna try and work on that this year. And I had a, a pair of other students who came behind Mike um, uh, work on a citator for the site and they hyperlinked all the citations in our corpus so that you could, when reading one opinion, see a citation, click on it and go to that document assuming we have it. Um, we spun off the web crawling portion of the project and called it Juriscraper it's what goes out and gets those daily updates um, and currently covers all the federal appellate courts and the Supreme Court, specialty federal courts like the Court of Claims and the Tax Court, and the International Trade Commission, Veterans, so on. Um, about half the states, their court of last resort, and in many cases their uh, mid-level courts uh, are covered, but we still have some work to do there. Uh, court websites are notoriously bad right, and difficult to navigate and, and interact with programmatically. So <clears throat> there's a few tougher ones still to tackle. Um, just to give you a flavor of, of what that amounts to, I checked and in December we added 3,429 documents. Um, that comes to about 163 documents each weekday right now. If we get done covering all the states, you know, maybe it'll be like 250 a day. It's not actually that big of a problem to keep up on a daily basis. Um, the Juriscraper framework has now been rewritten two or three times, so it's solid, right? It, it's just extend it to more courts, and we can just start ingesting those too. Um, so that, that problem I can solve soon, right? That is getting the law that came out today, right? <clears throat> that one's not so hard. It's the getting the everything <laughs> that, that came before that will re remain difficult. Um, I mentioned this citator that I had two students uh, work on. You know, one of the things you have to do uh, if you're going to build a citator is uh, identify all the citations uh, in a document, and that should be easy, right? <laughs> um, here's an actual example uh, of a case that they encountered and all the different ways they found it citated, right? Uh, cited. Um, the Blue Book has gone a long way to resolving this for us for more modern 
uh, opinions. We, we tend to get uh, citations that we can expect to be of a certain form, uh, but uh, there's still other problems, right? Uh, while the Blue Book can handle this standardization of the format, what we really need is to adopt a citation format that can be known upon the first publication of a digital document by the court rather than a format that can only be known once West Publishing decides to place it in a bound print volume. You know, this is, this is a document management strategy. It's just a 19th century document management strategy. Um, some jurisdictions have adopted neutral citation formats that solve this problem, but there's lots of jurisdictions and they all make their own rules, so it's a big task. Um, doing document management without unique identifiers is madness, right? This, uh, the, the computer scientists just laugh at us lawyers that you do what? You have citations to documents that are not unique? Well, like if it's a really short opinion, there might be multiple documents on the same page and they would have the same citation and they just look at me like I'm insane. I'm like, I didn't come up with this, right? You know, um, and don't get me started on docket numbers, right? The same court will reuse them for for a civil case and for a criminal case and for a bankruptcy case. Yeah. So they did this work on the citations and when it was complete, it occurred to me, I could ask and answer a question that previously I would have had to go ask permission from a major vendor. Uh, what's the most cited case? I can't answer that with complete generality. I have to look at in my corpus, right? that's the best I can do. But I just did one simple query, answer came back, Strickland v. Washington, a Supreme Court case, on the ineffective assistance of legal counsel in death penalty cases. So of course it gets cited in every habeas petition um, and in our corpus, you know, quite popular. <clears throat> um, right now, we only identify citations to case law, not to statutes. Um, but once we add the identification of statutes in, other people have worked on that problem and we can build on their work, I hope. Um, I could ask, what's the most cited statute? Again, in our corpus, I'd rather have everything so I could answer this question with full generality. But that would be really interesting. It would go some way towards answering what's the most litigated part of the U.S. Code, for instance. Why would I want to know that, right? Because I might, if I found out a list, here's the top ten most litigated statutes, I could start digging a little deeper and say, well, why is that? Is it because they're unclear statutes? Should we revise these statutes? Why are they litigated so much, right? You know, is there some lurking policy issue we could discover, right, just by having the ability to ask and answer this question. Um, I promised I was going to talk about the academic research uh, that we try to do uh, with the platform. And so just a couple more examples of that. Um, I've been working with a computer scientist at uh, Santa Cruz and her PhD student uh, who is now finished and has the PhD. And we basically created what I think of as a research assistant that suggested additional opinions to you based on the ones that the users selected as relevant to their research task. And then it also explained to them why it was recommending these other opinions. This one's in the same jurisdiction as that other one that you liked, or this one cites three of the same cases as that other one that you said was relevant. And it tries to tell you why it's doing what it's doing. And so we ran some experiments and some poor law students had to get the broken down, unenhanced version of Court Listener and others got the enhanced version. And we thought, I mean, your hypothesis would be, well, maybe they'll be faster, they'll be more efficient, there'll be some of these things. Turned out, maybe it was just a small sample size. We actually didn't get statistically significant results on any of those that you might hypothesize. Instead, we found, to a statistically significant degree, that those who used it had a better understanding of the content of the results relevant to their research task. We asked them to explain, why did you include this opinion in your list? You know. And they had better answers. They were like, well, this one is relevant because blah, blah, blah. And so it was really interesting. I'm not completely sure I understand why that is. But in using the tool, I sort of, I repeatedly said to this PhD student, I don't care if we get statistically significant results. This is the coolest thing I've ever used for legal research, right? This is awesome. It's so fun, right? To, and, and to me, it seems like fast at getting me precisely the documents I was looking for, right? And, We'll get it online on the, on the live site uh, sometime later this year, I hope. Um, last fall, uh, two students in a, a colleague's uh, NLP class did a small project trying to use NLP techniques to extract keywords and key phrases for an opinion using a sample of our corpus. Um, they were able to compare their results uh, to some human-generated opinion tags. And 
what I would say is this is hard, <laughs> right? Their results were not something I would put on the website yet. Um, <clears throat> and um, we've got some ideas, right, about how you could make it better. But <clears throat> these techniques uh, and the technologies that are out there for this kind of thing are getting better and better. I think in some cases it might be, you know, our ability to apply the existing technologies was not so high. Um, these were students just learning this material for the first time and they only spent a couple weeks on it. But um, it should be possible to do that sort of thing. Uh, there's some folks down at USC who do computer networking uh, and in particular have studied the citation networks in academic journals. Um, they just flipped their lids when they found out they could download um, our corpus and it would have all the citation relationships in there. Um, they like the legal citation network because we express sentiment. We say, you know, I'm rejecting that prior opinion or I'm following it, right? I'm distinguishing this case from that one. And um, if I could get the better metadata about the author of each opinion, which judge wrote the opinion, um, then I could do something like, how does Justice Scalia's word cloud compare to Justice Kagan's? <laughs> right now I don't have all that metadata, but Here's a word cloud I made from First Circuit cases on June 9th, 2009. It looks like there were some evidence and hearsay and property issues resolved that day. It's kind of interesting to, to think about visualizing uh, the legal corpus in different ways. Last slide, how do we pay for all this? Well, so far we don't, right? Uh, it's out of Mike and Brian's pockets. Um, a few friends have helped out, uh, some from the School of Information where I am, we have Citrus, the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. They gave seed funding for that work with the professor at Santa Cruz. Um, Carl Malamud at publicresource.org. Uh, uh, he's just a, a, a legend in this area, and we're indebted to him enormously. Um, he gave us that Supreme Court corpus. He gives it to everybody. It's on his website. You can go download it now. Um, and also uh, funded uh, Mike's works for a, a period of months. Uh, I guess that was last year or the year before. Um, but last year we formed a nonprofit, the, what we call Free Law Project, to serve as the sponsoring organization of all these activities. Um, basically, even though Mike sort of recently made this his full-time job, we haven't actually paid him for it being his full-time job yet. And so that's the game plan, is to try to find a way to pay him to make this his full-time job. I've never made a dime off of any of this. We're seeking some small grants. Um, you can donate. Uh, we, we learned though after putting up the donate button that the world was not sitting next to their computer screens waiting to donate to free law, right? Um, no puppies are saved, no cancer cured through our efforts and so it's a tough competitive landscape um, in terms of getting foundations to care about your issue. You know, you'd think that the thwarting of tyranny, right, ought to uh, attract some attention um, but it's a harder sell than that and so um, I think what is ultimately going to be the answer here is uh, we've got a couple different pitches that we're going to take to some of the larger foundations and ask for much larger amounts um, than your you know, $20 donation. And <clears throat> I think if we can just get one of those to come through, we'll be in good shape for a while. Um, if you have uh, you know, close friends at you know, large foundations, uh, please speak with me uh, afterwards. Okay, thanks very much. I'll answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so um, Professor Carver will also join us for our uh, Codex group meeting uh, today at 3 o'clock. We're actually meeting every Thursday in uh, room uh, 102 in the Newcomb building. And so if anyone uh, wants to join us, anyone interested in uh, legal technology, uh, people with you know, their own ideas that they want to test with the group, uh, please uh, come to our weekly group meetings every Thursday, 3 o'clock, uh, room 102. Um, and, um, yeah, just a um, um, quick question for you. Um, do you see uh, many startups already using your, your corpus and your, your APIs? I know, I know you and <coughs> Pablo have been working together on some things. Yeah, we know of a few. Uh, I think uh, the folks at Sumo Brain have said in the past that they use uh, our documents to get started. They, I think, are focused on patent law in particular. Um, and we have good coverage of the uh, uh, federal circuit. Uh, I think we have it all, right? <laughs> um, so 
uh, updated daily. Right? All right. Um, but uh, we don't do. We don't even. I don't think you even have to be logged in to download our entire corpus, right? Mm -hmm. We just give it all away and and don't ask for you to even say thanks, right? You know. Mm -hmm. um, so in some cases, uh, there could be folks using it, and we just don't know. Uh, I have other things to do. I don't dig through the <laughs> logs looking for IP addresses or something, right. you know. So uh, um, uh, there are a few others though who have told us they were using it, and I I, I can't think of them now, but. Um, we get contacted constantly by folks in this space, um, and they're really excited, and usually, and like, oh wow, I can't find this, you know, anywhere else. And um, it's it's that's what I think one of the things we really enjoy is that when people do reach out and, and uh, we get to start talking with them and finding out what we could do better. But there's lots of things that could be better, and usually they have some niche. You know, problem that they're trying to solve, and like, oh, okay, we could do that. We didn't know that anybody wanted it to do that. You know, and so we can address that once they reach out. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. So I had a question. One of the things you mentioned was that you look at basically just court opinions. Have you guys branched out to other documents, legal briefs, anything like that? Yeah. So <clears throat> um, we don't do statutes, for instance, because there's other people who are already working on that and doing a great job. And we figure at some point in the future, we'll just integrate every all the good work <laughs> that they've done on that. And we haven't yet branched out to the documents on a court docket beyond the opinions, um, in part because where the federal system is concerned, um, the guys at RECAP uh, from Princeton are covering that as well as anyone is, right? And so we figure, let them handle that, and we will integrate their corpus at some point in the future. Um, and uh, th the documents beyond the opinions at the state level, it, it's a much messier proposition. And even getting your hands on the materials is sometimes impossible or costly. Uh, this morning, I wanted to get, or maybe it was last night, I wanted to get a, a, anything uh, off the docket of a Superior Court case down in LA knew the name of the case. I even found the case number. Right? I was ready. I get there, and I hit a paywall. And I was like, wait a minute. i got to register for an account, and they're going to charge me something. I don't know what to, to access documents. And when I use Pacer, I always make mistakes, and I get $25 searches that I get charged you know, like by accidentally clicking. I've got one of those I'm fighting with them about now. Right? You know, and so I saw this paywall, and I was like, uh, OK, never mind. Right? You know, and so um, especially if I'm going to run a crawler, uh, I'm going to need a lot of money to, to deal with uh, those documents beyond uh, the opinion. Um, uh, like in Alameda County, where I am, the search interface uh, requires you to know the case number. There's no other pathway in, right? You can't know the case name. You can't just say me, show me cases filed today or in which there was activity today. No. Right? If, OK, so if, if you're crafty. <laughs> <laughs> and you hack it, right? You can get in through other means, right? But so that's just a disaster. And and it's uh, every county in California has its own system, and then every state and every county and every state, you know. So it's a big problem to deal with those documents beyond that. And I, I think what I generally say to people is, yeah, I'm interested in all that stuff. And if you've got it, I'll take it. And if you show me an easy way to get it, I'll go get it. Um, but Right now, we have so much work still to do just on the opinions from, you know, states like Maryland, right? You know, that are pretty important, right? You know, um, uh, that we're going to do that first. Right? And once we get that handled, then we can turn our attention to these other things. Hi. So thanks for the talk, and thanks for Court Listener. I use it on Plainsight, and I know other people use it too. Um, so my question is, Going back to what you're saying about things being expensive, to what extent do you see you and Mike, maybe whether this year or sometime in the future, looking at more activism type projects versus more coding type projects? Because I, I know it's kind of a balance between doing all the work that clearly needs to be done, but also uh, I don't see a lot of people anymore writing letters to courts and kind of banding together. And I think that might be just as effective as coding lots of scrapers. Yeah. So what do you think about that? 
We, we've often thought about that. For instance, um, in, in scraping the courts I mentioned, we encounter websites that are hard to deal with. We have often thought, <clears throat> we'd be glad to give you a free you know, opinion listing page right, and the back end to run it um, if, if it just included all the metadata we want and was easy to traverse, was HTML <laughs> compliant, you know, like these kind of things. Um, and so we've thought about coding something like this up and just giving it to the courts and saying, please use this instead of the mess that you have right now on your website, you know, these kind of things. Um, the one, I guess, and we thought about writing letters, and, and in some cases we, we have contacted places and said, okay, what you're doing is atrocious, we can't work with this, will you please, you know, do something else? And usually they're like, no, right? You know, like every court is its own little kingdom, and they make their own rules and their own decisions, and there's one IT guy in every one of these places, and uh, you're at the mercy of some of these folks. So um, it's, it's unclear... I guess what uh, result we would get from it, not that that would daunt me, I, I'm glad to take on uncertain <laughs> projects, <laughs> but um, it would also be an exhausting task because there's just so many people you would need to write, right? You know, because it is uh, every, in California, you would need to write every single county, right? You know, um, there's only 58, <laughs> and, and the Supreme Court and the Circuit Court of Appeal in each, you know. Okay, so we're at 75 letters just for California or so, right? And so on, you know. And we just don't have anybody to dedicate to tracking down those addresses, right, for us. Um, if you send them to me and I can do a quick mail merge, maybe, right? Um, uh, when instead we could spend our time you know, trying to rescue oral argument audio from disappearing. Or, you know, there's other things that are sort of uh, got us more worried. Yeah. So, uh, great project. Thanks for, for doing it. Super useful, I think. A couple of questions on how you're gathering information and adding it to the corpus. How are you or are you sort of going back historically and getting things that didn't exist electronically and are basically sitting in bound volume somewhere? And uh, second, when you use your scraper, are you encountering court websites where you have, you know, terms of service or other technical limits that say don't crawl this site, don't try to take our stuff in an automated fashion? And if so, how do you deal with that? So, <clears throat> good questions. We um, some courts actually do have a decent back corpus up, right? Um, like say to back to '97 or something, right? And so we write back scrapers that just go back and get anything they do have on their website. Um, I can't wait till we crawl the uh, American Samoa website because it goes back to the very beginning. There's like over a hundred years of American Samoa law, right, on their site. Um, um, so, uh, you know, some have quite nice collections already up there, um, and so we can get it that way. Um, but a lot of it has come from data donations and people who have worked on this before, like Carl Malamud um, had. F third, pretty much, you know, done already, and so we just integrated what he had, and he had the Supreme Court corpus, and so on, and so um, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Is, is part of the answer. Then on your your, your second question of um, terms of service, we take I think sort of a split approach. <clears throat> One is that our robot announces to the world that it is Juriscraper. That's a pretty unique name. If you Google for it, you will find us. Right, and so we're we're not trying to hide. We tell you exactly who we are, and if you don't like what our bot is doing, you can get in touch with us. No one ever has, right? Um, and I think it's because there are much more ill-behaved bots out there that we encounter on our own site. Uh, you know, uh, Chinese search engines and others. Um, all the search engines are crawling these court websites already, no matter what their terms of service might say, and so they're already dealing with that. Very few of them have taken any effort to try to stop it, or uh, there's very little indication. I can think of maybe two court websites, right, where it looks to me like, wow, this must be designed to stop scraping, right? You know, um, but otherwise, it's not on their radar, and, and we try to time things so that we're not. We, we built some intelligence into it so that we don't download everything on your page every single time we visit. We look at, you know. Is this a, a, we take a hash of the page initially, actually, and make sure that the page has changed at all since we last visited. And if it hasn't, we just move on, 
right? You know, come back next round, right? Um, if the page has changed, then we're like, okay, what changed, right? We start looking and we'll grab an opinion, check its hash, say, oh, we don't have that one, add it to the database, go to the next line, check that opinion. If it's a hash that we've seen before, then we say, huh, we may be done, right? We may now have all the new material, but we'll check one or two more just to make sure things aren't out of order because this happens on these terrible websites. Um, and, but after you check three or four in a row and they're the documents you already have, you stop and you move off of their site. And so, you know, if you're only downloading one or none or two documents from their site uh, an hour, you, I don't think we even show up on the radar, right? You know, it, it, so it's, it's not been a problem. And I guess the other thing is I, I just don't investigate or read terms of use sites at all on these sites because I wouldn't obey them if I knew what they said because in my mind, these are public documents. I'm fighting tyranny. I cannot be bothered by your robots.txt file, right? If you have a problem with what I'm doing, you can contact me and then I'll tell you again that I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank, thank you so much. We're pretty much pretty much at the end of our time, but thank you for, for coming down here today and talking about your wonderful project. Thanks. Uh, and, so.